Welcome to the Juneteenth Legacy Project in Galveston, Texas. I am your host tonight, Samuel Collins III. I am the co-chair of the Juneteenth Legacy Project. Special guests tonight are Mr. Danny Asbury L. with SOL International. He's brought augmented reality to Houston and also to Galveston. The other special guest is Ms. Sharon Gillins, a member of Reedy Chapel Church the genealogist, the researcher, the superhero when, we, when you need to find a document, uh, a historical document. And then we also will have joining us the mayor of Texas City. Last year in 2020, Juneteenth became very popular, but I want you to know that Juneteenth has always been important since June 19th, 1865, to the people of Galveston, to the people of Texas, and to the former enslaved and their descendants. So while it was very popular last year, we've been celebrating since June 19th, 1865, the first publicly known celebration. I, I don't wanna steal her thunder, but it was Ju January 1st, 1866 at Reedy Chapel. And you'll hear more about that from Ms. Sharon Gillins. But I wanted to just talk about some of the activities on the island this year. Tonight, they're having a special program at Ashton Villa that is sold out. Uh, tomorrow, Nia Cultural Center will have a special on four iconic black women from Galveston, Texas. That is uh, Miss Isola Fedford Collins, Jesse McGuire Dent, Maud Cuny Ware, and Miss Yeager. I can't think of her first name, but these are four women that were very impactful on the island BOIs. In addition to that, we will have a program on June 19th at Ashton Villa at 10 o'clock, a celebration, the 42nd annual uh, celebration of Al Edwards and his work. Uh, at 11.30, we will have the art installation mural dedication at 2201 Strand. And, and sometime that's 2211 or 2217 is referenced, but that entire block We'll have a celebration to uh, just celebrate this amazing public art installation. Uh, this mural that is 5,000 square feet uh, is so impactful right now. It, it is one of the hottest public projects in the country. So uh, we, with that in mind, we have uh, Danny Asbury L out there. Uh, Danny, will you tell us a little bit about the augmented reality and how it will work and uh, just how you got involved uh, with the project. Yes, so I was approached by uh, Reginald Adams. I was also approached by Sam Collins. And uh, thank you all for bringing me into this project. Uh, my company has been doing uh, augmented reality murals. Uh, we were the first to do it in Houston and now in Galveston. And so I wanted to uh, first off send, send, first off send thanks for that. But um, how the app works is you would simply uh, download your, uh, you would download the app, the Uncover Everything app. We are partners with Uncover Everything um, app development company. And so uh, we've utilized, um, the technology to create uh, those historical murals that we've worked on in the past. And so we've also applied it here. What you do is you download the Uncover Everything app onto your phone via uh, your Google Play Store or your applications uh, store in, um, uh, in, on your iPhone. And it, it looks like a little camera little gray camera and it says uncover everything. And once you've downloaded that, uh, then you can scan the mural that you see here. And on each one of these circles, you will see uh, the different stories 
on um, on each each one of the figures that you see. Uh, it will pop up through your phone. It'll pop up through the app, and it's it'll give you a 4D experience. That is exciting. As we transform this corner into an outdoor classroom, uh, this magnificent mural, which represents kind of icing on the cake, uh, but there's so much more to the story, uh, the augmented out uh, a reality piece, the history behind the the paint in the plaster in this block of 2200 strand. It, it's just an amazing story. So, uh, Danny, before we go, could you tell us a little more about your nonprofit organization so people can know other work that you've done in places in Houston? Yes. So, our nonprofit, uh, we revive community through arts and culture. We've done murals in Independence Heights, uh, we've done murals in, uh, um, on the northeast side of Houston, uh, as well as the uh, Renaissance Center. Um, that is located on OST and Scott. And then we're also being a part of the augmented reality end of this beautiful mural that you see today, a part of the Juneteenth Legacy Project. And we also do more than visual arts. We provide entertainers, we provide jobs for artists. We insure our artists with health insurance. We do a lot for the arts community in general. Well, that, that is wonderful. You're actually going to have a band come down to be a part of our program. Could you tell us a little bit about the Zodico band that will be performing at the Juneteenth Legacy Project? Yes, ma'am, Miss Sharon, I see the hand. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then also, you, you're doing some more historical markers in the city of Galveston, correct? Uh, yes, some... we are. Yes, we are. We want to bring the walls to life. We want to bring these statues and we want to bring these historical markers to life because it's one thing to read it, but we want it to be accessible to uh, the people who are a part of the, uh, uh, of the, of the community, um, of the community who happens to be disabled, right? So anyone that's blind, they could hear the words, right? And anyone that's deaf, they could see the captions. So, we want to make sure that we include everyone into our particular vision. And the Zydeco band that we have uh, <laughs> that's coming, all I can tell you is they are phenomenal. They are phenomenal. So, um, And the name of the band? Yes. And so the name of the band, the name of the Zydeco band that we have is Jay Witt Style <laughs> Zydeco Band. And right. they are just, they are just awesome. They are just awesome. Oh my goodness. Very well, Danny, I know you have another appointment uh, this evening. So we thank you for joining us. We thank you for bringing the augmented reality to Galveston and using your talent and your influence with others to uh, make that available. As you said, for those that are disabled that maybe need to read the captions and those who need to hear it because they haven't always been able to experience the historical markers and structures. And now with this app and with the aid of others, they'll be able to experience that. So thank you so much for joining us tonight on tonight's show. And we look forward thank to you. seeing you next week. All righty, thank you. All right. Next, we will have the mayor of Texas City, Mayor Dedrick Johnson. Uh, Mayor uh, Johnson started working with me several years ago, uh, actually as the DJ at our first Juneteenth event at Stringfellow Orchards. And now he has been so busy in his political career, he is now the mayor of Texas City. And Texas City has some wonderful events going on here in Galveston County related to Juneteenth. So Mayor Johnson, would you fill us in on all the wonderful things? And I know you have the hottest ticket in Galveston County with the poetry slam. It is fire. Well, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Collins. And I appreciate you and all the work that you've done in and around Galveston County to help us celebrate the Juneteenth holiday. We are excited this year as we have been in uh, the previous 13 years, 14 years in Texas City. The city of Texas City has been great in helping us celebrate this wonderful uh, occasion in this, this American holiday of freedom as it relates to Juneteenth. Uh, this year we have a uh, kind of a, a shaved down celebration, if you will, thanks to uh, 
the pandemic. Uh, we are not doing as much as we've done in the past, but we still wanted to commemorate this, this holiday. So we do have three major events lined up. And on June 15th, I believe that's Tuesday, June 15th, we're having our annual golf tournament at Bayou Golf Course. The Juneteenth golf tournament uh, is something that's it's very popular every year among our golfers. You want to get out there and your teams of four and, uh, you know, just have a great time at Bayou Golf Course. Following that, we have one of our signature events, Friday, June 18th, at the Charles Doyle Convention Center in Texas City. We have the annual Juneteenth Poetry Slam. And as Mr. Collins has alluded to, that's one of our uh, biggest events on the mainland uh, with poets from the Houston, uh, uh, Galveston, and surrounding areas. Uh, we have them coming all, as far as all the way from Austin, Texas, to come and uh, participate in the art of spoken word poetry. And if you haven't experienced that, then that's something you definitely want to partake in. Uh, tickets are on sale now. Uh, at the Doyle Center, and that's pretty much the only thing that we have that we charge for the public. Uh, the Poetry Night is uh, not only full of poets, but we have DJ, we have music, we have red carpet, we have a Harlem Renaissance theme, uh, nice, nice uh, food and everything. It's just a great social celebration. Following that on Saturday morning, uh, we want to come over here to Galveston and celebrate with our, our sister city of Galveston Island and everybody who is celebrating all of the festivities here in Galveston with uh, their parade and with their uh, uh, tour of this uh, wonderful artistic museum and the mural and all that they, they have lined up. But Saturday afternoon in Texas City at three o'clock, we have our parade on the mainland. The Texas City Juneteenth Parade begins at three o'clock p.m. and it ends on Bay Street at the Texas City Dyke Rainbow Park. And there we have a slate of activities for the children, not only park activities, moonwalks, barbecue cook-off contest. Uh, we have uh, also a special guest, uh, Jeter Jones. Jeter Jones all the way from Louisiana. He's coming to you to bring you some good Bayou uh, Zotico R&B music. And uh, he has his own style and you definitely want to check out Jeter Jones. There's plenty to do for everybody in the family. We want y'all to come out and bring the kids, bring the family and just help Texas City in Galveston and Galveston County celebrate the Juneteenth holiday. Wow, so many activities there in Texas City uh, in Galveston County is ready to let the nation know that nobody celebrates Juneteenth like we celebrate Juneteenth. So it's great to see our neighboring cities uh, uh, joining in the celebration with the mural. But before I jump to to Sharon, I do want to go back to the mayor and just have you just talk about what it means to be mayor this year to host some of these events and and what Juneteenth means to you and that that finally that you were able to ascend to the mayor position because I believe people need to understand that without June 19th, 1865 you would not have been able to be in position to be a mayor. I wouldn't be able to be in position to be in my professional career as a financial advisor. And many of the things that we're experiencing today would not be possible if not for the events of June 19th, 1865 in Galveston, Texas. So would you just speak about that a little bit because that's an inspiring story of your career and path to being the mayor of Texas City. Uh, yes, sir. That You're exactly right, Mr. Collins. Um, it has been a journey, uh, a journey that I can definitely say <laughs> I'm blessed. And, uh, you know, it's not something that I did, but it's something that we did. And we being the citizens of Texas City, we being the voters, uh, we being those who were knocking on door to door. For those of you who know my personal story, and I grew up in Texas City, a uh, young black boy on the south side of town and was educated in the Texas City schools and I went off to college and came back to uh, give back to my community through community service and civic activities. And I had my hand in city government as a city councilman uh, for 16 years. And I stepped away from government for a little while, but the opportunity presented itself to where our longtime mayor was vacating the seat. And so I threw my name in the hat and I knew it was a long shot because Texas City and it's uh, 110 history, 110 year history had never had an African-American mayor. And so not only 
have we never had an African-American mayor, but we never had an African-American mayoral candidate. And so it was very important for me not to uh, just uh, put my name on the ballot, but to give it a valiant effort because there were so many young boys and girls, my children included, who need to see that we can do anything we want to do when we prepare ourselves for it and when we put our mind to it. And I was, I was prepared uh, for the task at hand, but I couldn't do it by myself. It took a community effort of voters and not just African-American voters, but voters all throughout the city of Texas City who believed in me and who had confidence in me. But Mr. Collins, as you stated, none of this could have been made possible had it not been for June 19, 1865, when uh, those troops came on the island of Galveston to bring that news that all slaves are free. And we all today are eating apples. I like to say we're eating apples off of trees we didn't shake. There were so many people who came before me. There's so many people who tread this path down which I walk. And, 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 and I'm trying to tread a path for my children to follow. And so we're very grateful for our forefathers. We're very grateful for those who fought, who, who hung, bled, and died, and sweat for our freedoms. And, and since we are here at a point to where we can experience the freedoms of America, it's up to us to do something with them. Not to sit down by the sidelines and say, okay, we're free and I'm gonna kick my feet up. But it's up to us to continue to fight in the struggle for the next generation so that they too can reap the benefits of our work, of our sweat, of our blood, of our tears. And so I'm very grateful. Uh, I would be uh, remiss if I said that this was something that was uh, of an individual accomplishment. This is what we call a multi-generational accomplishment. And so we're going to celebrate Juneteenth and we're going to celebrate the history. Uh, I'm humbled to be the first African-American mayor of the city of Texas City as I continue to learn more about the governmental office and make sure that the Juneteenth holiday is something that continues to be celebrated in the city of Texas City. Uh, I was able to host Juneteenth Poetry Night for the past 13 years as our city has always supported Juneteenth. And I want to go a little bit beyond supporting Juneteenth but I want to go not only through supporting Juneteenth, but promoting Juneteenth, being a little more intentional and assertive as it relates to educating our general public as to what exactly this holiday means to our people. So it's been a privilege and it's been an honor and it's something that I don't take lightly. And so we're, we're looking forward to moving forward with this holiday. All right, Mayor Johnson. Wow, uh, you know, if Mayor Johnson wasn't a Longhorn, I could love him. But being an Aggie, I just have to hold a little bit back. No, nah, we love you. We love Gigum. I see he's throwing up his Longhorn sign. Uh, Mayor Johnson and I, our, our lives have ran a parallel path. We have sons almost born on the same birthday. We have uh, four children uh, apiece. I mean, it's just uh, the, the parallels. I'm just not the mayor of Hitchcock. That's all. He's, he's the mayor of Texas City. So, uh, Mayor Johnson, thank you for sharing all of that. Uh, thank you for being a part of the program tonight. And when we talk about history, uh, Reedy Chapel, 1848, uh, the history on the island just goes back pre-1865. So we have the historian, the genealogist, the specialist, Miss Sharon Gillins, to tell us about the amazing program that Reedy is going to have this year, which they do each year. I, I spoke about some of the events, but I specifically wanted to hang this back so that Sharon could tell you herself what she has planned this year at Reedy Chapel. They have an annual event every year at six o'clock. So with no further ado, we're gonna turn it over to Reedy Chapel's own Miss Sharon Gillins. Well, thank you, Sam. Thank you so much for inviting me. It is so nice to be here. And you know, this is my season. I, I love I love Juneteenth and I love spreading the word about Juneteenth and spreading the history about uh, my church. I'm a trustee at Reedy Chapel AME Church and I'm also a genealogist. So I love history. I love digging up facts. I love finding out information. And so as I, since I was a member, I started to find out more and more about the history of Juneteenth as it relates to Reedy Chapel. So uh, we reenact the very first celebration of emancipation every year. 
And that celebration of emancipation includes a program at the church and the Emancipation March. The Emancipation March is from uh, the old Galveston Courthouse to the Colored Church on Broadway. And that Colored Church on Broadway is Reedy Chapel. Now, normally we have our program in the church, but because of uh, COVID uh, restrictions, we're having a virtual program this year. Uh, so our virtual program is in its final stages of preparation now, and we will run it on social media so that everybody out there can tune in and see it. It's going to be on um, Facebook at Reedy Chapel AME Church. It's going to be at Facebook at Galveston's I-45 Now, and also at Genealogy Quick Start, which is a, uh, a colleague's uh, web uh, video program that she does on YouTube and Facebook. So we have three places. So that means we're going to have national coverage of the program itself. On the program, we have wonderful guests. We've interviewed the co-founder of the Juneteenth Legacy Project, which is Mr. Sam Collins. We interviewed uh, the muralist for Absolute Equality, Mr. Reginald C. Adams. We have a performance by a wonderful musical artist whose name is Dominique Hammonds. He's gonna treat us to a violin um, music in a way that you would not expect. And we also have an interview with the grandmother of Juneteenth, Miss Opal Lee. We have drummers and dancers. And so I'm hoping that this is gonna be a wonderful program that people will be able to enjoy safely from home or in their, uh, as they move about throughout the city. And then at six o'clock, we invite everyone to come out and meet us at the old Galveston Courthouse, which is on the corner of 19th and Winnie in Galveston at six o'clock. And then we will march in the footsteps of our ancestors from the old Galveston Courthouse to the Colored Church on Broadway. And that Colored Church on Broadway is Reedy Chapel AME Church. So. We're very proud of that history and we're so excited for the program this year. Wow, uh, you, you bring up Miss Opal Lee. She was just here yes, to walk for Memorial Day. And uh, you joined in that walk. Can, can you just share what that experience was like to walk with her at 94 years old? Well, that Miss Opal Lee is a total inspiration. She is an energetic uh, woman on a mission. and she is clear thinking and she knows exactly what she wants to do. She has gathered over a million signatures on a petition to make Juneteenth a national holiday. So of course, the people of Galveston are definitely on board with that. And what she does to raise awareness of that, she travels all over the country to cities all over the country and she walks 2.5 miles to symbolize the two and a half years that it took for uh, in, uh, emancipation to be enforced here in Texas. So Texas already has a uh, state holiday and just about every state has a state holiday, but freedom is a national, this is a national event. It should not be relegated to black history or Galveston history or Texas history or our church history. This was a national of national import. And Ms. Opal's vision is clear. She knows what she's going to do, and I believe she's going to do it. So walking with her was certainly an inspiration. I felt very honored to be able to be a part of that. And so I feel like uh, I am a part of her history, and she is definitely a part of the American history. Well, you know, she was here also with the National Miss Juneteenth, 18-year-old Sonia oh, yes. Gay. She was uh, adorable. So she came in from Delaware, uh, and she is an inspiration to the next generation. Uh, she walked alongside Miss Opal, and Miss Opal was pushing a uh, uh, stroller with her great-great-granddaughter in it. It, it was just amazing to see this multi-generational, so that's five generations of individuals that uh, she had her grandchildren there, her, her great-grandchildren. And, and I don't know if she had one of her children there, but uh, at 94, 
uh, she had me working out two months ahead of time. I was yes. not going to let Miss Opal outwalk me <laughs> at 94 years old. So she actually took 1.5 million signatures to Washington, D.C. last October. And she had been to Galveston before in September of 2019. So this was her second visit back to walk here uh, in Galveston. We went by some uh, historic sites. And as we talk about this history, I wanna remind individuals that um, we're working to expand the narrative around this Juneteenth story. So as we walk through the streets of Galveston, we pass historic locations. We started at McGuire Park, and I said McGuire Park intentionally, because prior to it being called Menard Park, it was owned by the McGuire family, Robert McGuire. And we started at the 2700 block of Seawall, and we left there and we walked straight down C, uh, down 27th and we passed Kempner Park. And Kempner Park, once uh, the residents at that area were Robert Mills, was Robert Mills, who was the largest enslaver in the state of Texas. He, he and his brother, David Mills, uh, owned 850 people. And the reason that I bring that up is when you think about these soldiers that came into Galveston, to bring the message of freedom. They were not only bringing the message of freedom to the enslaved people, but also to the enslavers, uh, making them uh, know that they no longer could auction off people and own people. And it was 75% of the Union forces that came into Texas were United States colored troops. And nowhere in elementary, junior high, high school, or even my college courses did I ever uh, read about that. Maybe they had those books at the University of Texas, and you don't have to unmute, Mayor, uh, but I don't think they had them at the University of Texas either. Uh, and if they did have the books, they were not teaching from those books in the history classes. Because what I've also found out, and Sharon can attest to this, at the Galveston and Texas History Center, a lot of this information is uh, in their collections, but we have not always had access to the records. And now that we have access to go through these records in Washington, D.C., in Galveston, Texas, and other depositories where these historical documents are, we're able to read and see this history ourselves. So in 2012, when I first started raising money to get a, a Juneteenth marker, many people thought we were trying to take the focus off of Ashton Villa, but it had been brought to our attention. One, Galveston didn't have a Juneteenth marker. And I felt somewhat embarrassed by that because I had been the chairman of the African-American Heritage Committee and I felt I should have done something sooner, but the best time to do something is to do it now. If you hadn't done it yesterday, uh, you may not have tomorrow. The best thing to do is to do it now. So we went to work raising the $1,900 to get the Juneteenth marker down on the strand. and. Um, we were able to place it in the ground on June 19th, 2014. I watched them as they did it and they placed it there. And then we had a market dedication program on June 21st, 2014 to kick off a year long celebration leading up to the sesquicentennial celebration of Juneteenth in 2015. At that time, I thought we have this uh, Juneteenth story as a caboose to the Civil War commemorations that started in 2011, the sesquicentennial. So we placed the marker there to bring attention to this intersection. But as I passed that intersection, I would notice not everyone was reading the marker. And I saw that blank wall behind the marker, Old Galveston Square. And it's like a light went off. Bingo, that's the location we need to tell the story. And as the country began to reimagine monuments and memorials and public spaces, uh, I was used as an instrument. Uh, there were times uh, 20 years ago, I may try to take credit for the work that I was doing, but I believe today that we are all instruments used by our creator to do this work. So this work is not about Sam Collins. It's not about Danny Asbury L. It's not about Dedrick Johnson or Sharon Gillins or any individual. It's about our community collectively, as the mayor has said before, we did it together. He didn't win his mayoral election by himself. It took the votes of many people and not just African-Americans. 
we did not win our freedom by ourselves. So while 75% of the soldiers were United States colored troops, they were with white officers and other soldiers. One that has been left out of the story, Major Frederick Embry, who actually wrote General Order Number no. 3 and signed it. Granger was the commanding officer who's, who uh, signed General Orders 1 and 2, but Major Frederick Emory, who had been an editor of an abolitionist paper uh, before joining the Union, is the one that actually wrote and signed General Orders 3, 4, and 5. And I believe it is Emory, as M Ed Cotham has said, that it was Emory that included the words absolute equality. So before I forget, I want to go back and remind individuals that we will have a Juneteenth Festival on June 19th from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. I tried to get Miss Lawanda Allen on tonight, but she was said she was so busy getting plans together, she couldn't join us. But we want individuals to know that that program will be that afternoon after our mural dedication at 11.30. And at 4 o'clock, if you have not got enough of the history tonight, and enough of the history at the mural dedication or other programs, we will have a special presentation at the Grand 1894 Opera House at 4 p.m. that is being hosted by Dr. David McNally from the University of Houston. On the stage, I will be on the stage with Dr. McNally and Joseph McGill from South Carolina. If you have not heard Joseph McGill speak, you want to attend. Much love coming from Sharon. Joseph is, uh, he has a slave dwelling project where he goes to plantation sites and sleeps in uh, our former uh, slave quarters and uh, just has been doing this over a decade now. And he's committed to this work, not only with the slave dwelling project, but of telling the truth about our history. He's unapologetic about telling the truth of this history. So when we tell the truth, it's not to attack anyone's heritage. It's not to uh, uh, make them feel bad about the past. It's just to tell the truth. Uh, I, I uh, have been using this analogy about a, uh, we live in this American house together and we have to do the repair work to ensure that future generations can live in this house without cracks in the wall or busted pipes or bad wiring. Yes, it's gonna cost to rewire the house. Yes, it's gonna cost to replumb or maybe do the foundation work. But if we truly care about America and freedom and being the light on the hill for other countries around the world, then we must do this work to tell the full story. So what we're attempting to do at this outdoor classroom here on this corner is to tell the full story. I recently completed a documentary film about Juneteenth, the Galveston story. And I would like Sharon just to share a little bit about that because she's in the documentary about your experience with visitors to the uh, uh, corner and intersection, what you shared in the documentary. Well, I would, when the mural was being painted, I love to go down and just stand and watch the work being done. Uh, my husband is a drummer and he would go down and play while the artists were, uh, were painting. But I also like to watch the faces of the people who were passing by and their reactions to the mural. Of course, the 20, corner of 22nd and Strand is right in the heart of the uh, downtown historic district. It's very, very full of people from all over the world, certainly all over the country and, and indeed all over the world. And it's just gonna get more so with uh, the cruise ships. And so people would stand there and watch with interest, but I noticed just like you did that they did not read the Juneteenth, the Juneteenth marker. And so I started to ask people, are you aware what that mural represents? And most people would say no. So I would take the time to explain, it's the journey of African-Americans in this, in this country from the uh, earliest period of time with uh, Esteban coming to Galveston all the way up into the time of emancipation. But I would give some of the details about each one of the uh, distinct parts. So I was talking to this lady, she was pleasant, she was attentive and I turned and I motioned toward the mural just to point some things out. And when I turned back, tears were streaming 
down her eyes, I mean, down her face. I was surprised by that. And she just was so sincere in speaking to me through the tears. She said, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. I just didn't know. She kept repeating, I just didn't know. And uh, she was very moved by the narrative. And I think that is the effect that it will have on, on uh, people from who, anybody who passes by there. In addition to be, it being a tremendous work of art, it's also a, tr a tremendous depiction of a story. It is a narrative that hasn't been told. And I think people are now hungry for the facts instead of an altered narrative that we've been, uh, I guess you can say fed for, uh, you know, since eight, the 1800s about the true facts of the Civil War, how it started, why it started, what was the reason for uh, secession, the true reason for secession, and how Africans in this country gained their freedom, fought for their freedom, gained it, and began to build their life against odds that were still stacked against us. And so it is a story that needs to be told and I think people are ready to hear the facts. You know, I'm reminded of James Baldwin's quote, these innocent people are trapped in a history they don't understand. So mm -hmm. in the fire next time Baldwin writes that and you know, just one of the leading voices during that time period, it, it wasn't until later after becoming an adult that I began to read Baldwin. I wish I had been exposed to him earlier because I would be further down the road on this path of um, self-discovery and, 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 and this work that I'm doing now is, um, I, I feel almost a little cheated that, that I wasn't introduced to Baldwin earlier uh, by uh, the school system uh, in, in junior high or, or high school. And when we think about this, this history uh, over my shoulder, some of you may be able to see the contraband of war on May 23rd, uh, 1861, after the Civil War had begun in April of 1861. These three men represented in this painting, uh, Baker, Mallory, and Townsend, ran to Union camps. And when they got to that Union camp, uh, they were running for their own freedom. So they were not sitting idly waiting to be rescued. They took up uh, an effort to free themselves. So they were not happy and content to be enslaved. And once they got to the Union uh, uh, side, the Confederate officers sent a note to the uh, Union officers and said, hey, uh, your fugitive slave law says that you have to return our property. And Benjamin Butler made a decision that would forever change the war. He let them know that you are a foreign nation. You are the Confederate States of America. You are not part of the United States of America. Therefore, you are not under our constitution and as a foreign nation, we are at war and any property, since you consider them property, that we seize, we can use for our benefit. It was a major decision in the war. Sorry about that air condition kicking on if you heard that. But it was a major decision in the war. Not only was it beneficial for the union to get these former enslaved individuals to run over to the Union side with their physical bodies to then become soldiers and fight. But the intel that they brought with them was priceless. The intel of knowing where the uh, low tide was so that you could cross a river or creek, knowing the land and the territory of the South because they had lived there, they had hunted there, they knew where the good fishing holes were. So if the soldiers needed to eat, they could find fish and food. If they needed to get behind enemy lines and get behind them, 
They knew which plantation fields to cross and which areas to go. So that intel about where they were storing weapons and where uh, a lot of the activities in the Confederacy was going on, those former enslaved individuals took that intel in their minds. So even though they may not have been taught to read or write, they had common sense and they had intelligence that was not measured with an IQ test of some written test. And they took the talents of their skills with their hands and they used them to fight for freedom. They were patriots. They were true Americans. They were freedom fighters. And because of their involvement, uh, we eventually had Juneteenth. I wanna go back and, and talk about a young lady that is also part of the story that has kind of been left out of the mural conversation. The first sketch for the mural was done by a young artist named Chase Sampe. And Chase Sampe had uh, done this initial sketch with Gordon Granger sitting and the Union soldiers, the United States colored troops, and the other white soldiers standing behind him. And one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in this imagery is that these were men standing for freedom, that they were standing with their back straight and head up, and they wanted to fight for freedom. And, and, and Chase's family has a unique connection to Galveston. In a 1900 storm, she had an ancestor that was 96 years old in 1900. So I want you to just pause for a minute, minute and think. That means she was born either in 1903 or 1904. If her birthday hadn't come, she maybe would have turned 97. But she was over 90 years old. So think about what she had saw in her lifetime. She had been an enslaved person. She had lived from the early 1800s to her 60s by 1865. And I found the marriage license for uh, James Ward and uh, Alice Jones. Uh, and, and this 96 year old was the mother-in-law to James Ward and the mother of Alice Jones. And they got married, James and Alice got married in 1873. Probably the first marriage license for uh, the recently freed individuals in that family. And now the descendant was sketching an image that would be used on the side of this mural. That was the hope of the enslaved individual that their children, grandchildren, and future descendants would have an opportunity to live free and use their talents. Chase's grandfather, uh, Anthony Ward, is an artist. He did Juneteenth uh, t-shirts way back in the 1980s. I remember some of the very first uh, t-shirts that he did. And, and this talent in this family has been celebrated for decades. And now young Chase is gonna be part of this story. She's doing a very special painting that will be unveiled at the Opera House on June 19th at the 4 p.m. program. You do not wanna miss this image. It is the first image of its kind to ever be portrayed here in Galveston. And we're gonna help that young lady get some attention to this work of art. We're also gonna celebrate the artist, Mr. Reginald Adams and his team, Kadavian Baylor, Dantrell Boone, Joshua Bennett, Samson Adenube, and Cherry Meekins. This team of art superheroes have completed this marker uh, this this mural at this spot and, and turn this corner into an outdoor classroom. So uh, I think, I, oh, I forgot the Galveston Parade is at one o'clock on June 19th. I'm trying to make sure that I remember all of these activities. The Bryan Museum is gonna have a special program on Sunday, the uh, uh, June 20th, uh, that will feature the art of some young people in the community and their poetry. So if you haven't been to the Bryan Museum, you wanna go there. They also have a special program on that Thursday night at seven o'clock that uh, will feature Michael Hurd. Uh, he is uh, uh, at, at Prairie View uh, 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 A&M University. 
And uh, another place that you could go is to the Galveston CVB website to see a list of activities. So if I missed anything, uh, you can visit that website and, and see a list of activities at Galveston CVB. Uh, they have a, also, they have a, a, a Facebook page where they're listing activities. There have been so many interviews done regarding this mural. Uh, NBC Nightly is gonna do a special. That's a special on CBS, uh, KHOU in Houston. There's, there's, there's so much coverage on this important national story of Juneteenth. We want Juneteenth to be a national holiday. So I, I believe that Lamarck is also having a celebration on Sunday, uh, that Sunday afternoon, uh, a Juneteenth activity. So Juneteenth is not just one day here in Galveston County. It is a couple of weeks of celebration. My little hometown of Hitchcock normally would have a celebration, but what little bitty Hitchcock Juneteenth committee has decided to do, they are gonna donate $1,000. They've already voted on it. I just have to stop long enough to go pick up the check and bring it to Miss Sue Johnson. I want to speak about this executive director of the NIA Cultural Center that has put in almost three decades of work. Uh, she is uh, responsible for bringing the Freedom School to Galveston, I believe in 2007 or eight. So we're talking about 13, 14 years of history of highlighting the importance of literacy and reading and trying to make sure our students do not fall behind. Uh, she's done other programs with Kwanzaa and uh, uh, history bowls. It's just so many activities that Sue has done. And we thank her for her work in the Nia Cultural Center for being the nonprofit in the community for decades. There are so many new nonprofits popping up because of the opportunity to get funding for uh, racial equity and social justice. Let us not forget those that have been doing the work for decades. Let us not forget the institutions like Reedy Chapel that have been around since 1848. Let us not forget those that have been, uh, the, the shoulders that we stand on. So I, I want to acknowledge the work of individuals like the late Rev, uh, Reverend uh, Al Edwards, who was also a representative uh, that helped to get the bill passed in 1979 here in Texas, making Texas the first state to have Juneteenth as a state holiday. Now I believe we have 48 states, what I would call a super majority of states that acknowledge Juneteenth and it's important. We are so close to making it a national holiday and people say, well, why do we need another holiday on the calendar? Why should we spend the money paying people not to work. Well, when you think about Memorial Day, there are many individuals that had loved ones to pass away in January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, all throughout the year. But the country chose one day out of the year, the last Monday in May, to remember those that gave the ultimate sacrifice. America has yet to pick one day to acknowledge the end of slavery in America. Since June 19th is accepted in 48 states, yes, the message of freedom came to different territories at different times. No, there was not 50 states in 1865. It's only 34 states, I believe. But it is important that we tell this story and acknowledge this history and individual communities can celebrate on June 19th, the history of when freedom came to their area. So people will say, well, why should a state that wasn't in existence celebrate Juneteenth? It's a Texas holiday. Well, I would argue, why should anybody celebrate the 4th of July? There was only 13 colonies. Why should all 50 states celebrate it? Because it is the birth of freedom in our country. And June 19th is the birth of freedom for the formerly enslaved people and it's important that we acknowledge that date, even though we know in territories like Oklahoma, freedom did not come to the enslaved people there until five treaties were signed on June 14, 1866, almost a year later. But Oklahoma wasn't a state. Oklahoma was not as big as Texas. 
Uh, Galveston was the major port west of New Orleans, a commercial center of Texas. And by making the announcement here in June of 1865, over a quarter million people eventually found out they were free. So Galveston was a major commercial center. So we absolutely should acknowledge this history. And if we select one day, just one day on the calendar, June 19th, but on that day, like with Memorial Day, we can remember all the Freedom Days, January 1st, April 16th, May 20th, December 6th, when the 13th Amendment was ratified. See, it wasn't until the 13th Amendment was ratified that officially slavery ended in America, but that 13th Amendment had a clause that you cannot have slavery except for the punishment of a crime. And we know that convict leasing was evidence of them creating crimes to put individuals back on the same plantations they had been freed from. So this history needs to be talked about. So while you come to Galveston to celebrate the icing on the building, the icing on the cake, remember that there's so much more. Yes, normally you would bake eggs, flour, and sugar, but pain, suffering, and exploitation are the ingredients of this cake. We don't want to stay parked in the pain and suffering because we know individuals like George T. Ruby, Matthew Gaines were elected officials that help establish institutions like Prairie View A&M Uni University and, and Texas A&M University. It was black legislators that pushed for that public education. We know that there are individuals like John Rufus Gibson, who was a principal for 48 years here on the island. The island is an island of success. Our most famous native son, Jack Johnson, born March 31st, 1878. His parents were married in 1867. If not for Juneteenth, his parents don't get married and maybe not produce the individual Jack Johnson who became the world heavyweight champion. He doesn't attend the school where uh, John Rufus Gibson was the principal. Even though he did not graduate from Central, he was able to walk the halls there and see the life and example that John Rufus Gibson lived before him in the community, Norris Wright Cuny, Jesse McGuire Dent, uh, Maude Cuny Ware, and, and Ms. Yeager, and Ms. Isola Collins, and all of these other individuals. And I hate to name names because somebody will say, you left out somebody. So I'll go over to Sharon and just ask some of the people from Reedy, maybe you can name some other individuals. And then I'll ask uh, Mayor Johnson to name some of the people in Texas City that were successful individuals that we also need to tell their story. If not for Juneteenth, their story would not have been possible. So as we wrap up this evening, we don't wanna stay parked in slavery, but we want to celebrate what that freedom represented and the opportunity it presented. So Ms. Sharon, if you would go first and then we will have Mayor Johnson talk about some of the people in Texas City also. Well, you know, Reedy was the home of many of Galveston's most uh, respected uh, citizens. Uh, Norris Wright Cuny was a member of uh, Reedy Chapel. In fact, he laid the cornerstone to the current sanctuary. And uh, also, uh, uh, John R. J. R. Gibson was a member of Reedy Chapel. Uh, I believe that Mr. Ruby was, George Ruby was a member of Reedy Chapel. And coming uh, forward, I'd like to talk about Mrs. Isola Fedford Collins because her family was an original family of Galveston. They came here from Bolivar Peninsula and as soon as emancipation and they came to Galveston. And so they were one of the first uh, emancipated families in Galveston and they were members, have been members of Reed Chapel since that time. And Mrs. Collins wrote the book, Island of Color, several books about the history of African-Americans in Galveston. And she also founded the Galveston Heritage Corral, which was the, the mission of the Galveston Heritage Corral was to preserve the music of African-American composers and arrangers. So she did, she's done, that family has done awesome work. The other day I was doing uh, research into the slave na narratives of the WPA Works Progress Administration slave narratives. And I just was looking to see if there were any slave narratives in 
Galveston. And there was one done by a lady whose name was Molly Harrell. And it was done in the 1930s, but she was an enslaved person. She reports being an enslaved person. And the Harrell family is also a family that is uh, still members of Reedy Chapel AME Church. So uh, we have a well, very rich history. That's very great history. Mayor uh, Johnson, if you would just share a minute, uh, we have about two minutes before the show ends. If you just tell us some of the people in Texas City. Thank you, Mr. Collins. You know, there is a rich history in Texas City and the uh, community as well of those people who have just accomplished tremendous things uh, throughout our community history, but would not have been able to do so, as you said, had it not been for uh, Juneteenth. I want to start with Mr. George B. Sanders. Mr. George B. Sanders was the uh, principal of Booker T. Washington High School, and we have named the Sanders Center after him. We have Mr. Calvin Vincent, who was a board of trustee, one of the first African-Americans uh, school board members and uh, those to work in the city administration, school administration building. Uh, Mr. Thomas Carter, along with Mr. Lynn Ellison, were the first two African-American elected officials as councilmen who were both elected in 1978 uh, to the Texas City City Commission. Uh, we think about educators like uh, Ms. Myrtle Davis. Uh, Ms. Myrtle Davis taught for over 40 years in Texas City Independent School District, a home economics teacher. Uh, lots of families and mothers and grandmothers are cooking and ironing and sewing and making the things that she taught them to do. And we, we have people who are living legends today, like a uh, former judge and former constable, Sonny James Sr. You know, Sonny James has uh, got me involved in politics. And there's so many more, and I would be just remiss to try to name them all individually, but we're thankful for them as we continue to celebrate Juneteenth. Thank you, uh, Mayor Johnson. Um, before we go, I also want to make sure that we thank uh, Mitchell Historic Properties that gave us permission to put the mural on the side of the uh, building. And also Ms. Sheridan Mitchell Lorenz, who was an uh, early contributor and my co-chair with the Juneteenth Legacy Project. So she is the co-chair. We want to thank Stephen Kreitz that has worked uh, to help us bring in Mr. Reginald Adams. He was the one that nominated him. Christine Hopkins, Carla Clay, uh, Kenesha Allen, Sue jo Johnson. Uh, there are so many committee members and individuals and each and every donor that gave to this project, we say thank you. So on behalf of the Juneteenth Legacy Project and on, on behalf of citizens of Galveston County, I wanna say thank you to every donor, major or minor, every donation counted. Uh, so we wanna thank you for tuning in tonight. I am Samuel Lee Collins III, Certified Tourism Ambassador here in Galveston, Texas, and the co-chair of the Juneteenth Legacy Project. We thank the uh, uh, producer of this program tonight. I am your host signing off. And until next time, Houston Media Source, thank you for this opportunity to tell our Juneteenth Legacy Project story. Thank you.